זה כבר שנתיים, כבר לא 16 חודשים, שנתיים מאז שנכנס לחיינו ה-AI. כלומר, ה-AI היה בחיים שלנו, רק לא הכרנו אותו, והוא נגלה והפך להיות משהו כלי שימושי לבני, לבני האדם הפשוטים, כמונו. אני הייתי צריך להציג בדצמבר לפני שנתיים, חודש אחרי שזה יצא את פרופסור אומן בכנס באוניברסיטת בר אילן, ולא ידעתי איך להציג אותו בתור... פרופסור אומן, כבר חותן פרס נובל לכלכלה, כבר הצילו אותו כל כך, הציגו אותו כל כך הרבה פעמים, אז ביקשתי מ-AI שיכתוב לי שיר. אז הוא כתב לי שיר, כתב אותו בצורה יפה. אני לא יודע לכתוב שירים, אני לא יודע להקריא גם שירים, אבל הוא כתב אותו רק באנגלית. מאז עד היום זה עולם אחר. הדברים משתנים במהירות, ויש כאלה שטוענים ש... זה הולך להרוס את האנושות, יש כאלה טוענים שזה הולך לגרום לכך שנמריא, יש כאלה שטוענים שאנחנו הולכים לקבל למעשה אינטגרציה של האדם ביחד עם המכונה, עם המחשב, עד שנת 2050, יש הרבה דברים, ובשביל כך הבאנו את המומחה בתחום, הבאנו אותו ישירות מארצות הברית, מהרווארד, את מרק פייגן, Welcome to Israel, Welcome to the conference, we're very, very thankful that you're willing to come and give the talk. And uh, if anybody wants to know anything about AI, you're the guy. And uh, if you're not, if you want to hear more about her, more, go into the internet, go into the YouTube. He's just got a lot, a lot to give. Mark. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. And I am delighted to be here to talk about AI. But I'll also tell you, I'm delighted to be here in Israel. I haven't been since October 7th, and being on the land and being with the people has really been important to me. So independent of AI, you can't do it with AI. You got to be in person. So all that said, uh, let's go ahead and get started. So my beginning for you is the changes that are taking place, as Gil said, are so dramatic. And the question is, what happens in the future? So you can see my crystal ball. My job is to help think through with you and get your perspectives, what are the impacts of AI broadly on society? Kind of a big picture question. To get us started, since you've woken up this morning, how many interactions have you had with AI? So show of hands. If you think you've had five interactions, put your hand up. Oh, a lot of people are going to be very surprised at this. 10 interactions, 20 interactions, more than 50 interactions. Okay, this is the evidence of the case. So just shout out, what was your interaction? And if you can do it in English, that'd be great. Your hand was up for the 50. Go. Chat GPT and the bus schedule. Someone over here had their hand up. Give me another one. Ways. Okay. So I want to give you a very simple example. Did you have coffee this morning? Yes. Okay. So this is the coffee supply chain. So you start with the farm, you aggregate, you grade, you transport it, you, you roast it, you brew it, you drink it. So let me show you the impact of AI in each component. So the first component is about growing it. These days, coffee is being grown with what's referred to as precision agriculture. It's determining when do you put the seeds in the ground? How much water do you put out? When do you fertilize? All those kinds of issues. You use it for weather predictions on when you're going to harvest. Second, sorting, grading, fermentation control, defect control, all being driven through AI algorithms. My personal favorite, logistics, supply chains, we are using AI constantly to think about how we can optimize our supply chains. Inventory management, how much coffee do I take? Forecasting what the demand is going to be, all being driven out of AI. Beyond that, in terms of the actual roasting, it's issues around real-time monitoring. How are the beans sitting through this process? And finally, of course, you've got smart coffee machines, and ultimately, there's you. Voice-activated ordering. Algorithmic decision-making in terms of what you're going to suggest to you. And of course, smart cafes. This is just one little area. Coffee. 
And all of this is being driven by AI. Now, AI is important, but it is particularly important because we are seeing unparalleled adoption of AI. Do any of you know Everett Rogers or his work? All right. Oh, we got one. Fantastic. Appreciate that. We'll talk later. <laughs> Everett Rogers. Oh, let me ask a slightly different question. How many of you are familiar with the S-shaped adoption curve? You start out with the innovators and the early adopters. You get the early majority. You get the late majority. You get the laggers. Hands up for that. You can thank him for that. This is his work. He grew up in rural Midwest United States, farm community. As a kid, he says, he was fascinated by why did some farmers adopt new technologies, be it tools or seeds or approaches, and others didn't. And he spent his life trying to understand that. And that is his work is what led to the understanding of the S-shaped adoption curve. For the academics in the room, he's a hell of a model. Wrote this book in, I think, the late 50s, early 60s. Just reissued it every three years for the next 30 years. Brilliant model. OK, so now you understand what he does. So let me share with you some examples of the S-shaped adoption curve. And what we have is you can see the percentage of a population that is using a particular technology and how long it took for that adoption to take place. This happens to be in the US, but it could have been anywhere. And what you'll observe is whether it's the car, running water, or electricity, you see that S-shaped curve, and it takes a while. But as you're looking further towards the right more recently, you're seeing an acceleration of some of that adoption. You can look at cell phones. You can look at the internet relatively quickly, smartphones relatively quickly. Now, in saying this, I don't want you to conclude, oh, because we're more modern, we're accelerating, that the S-shaped curves are compressing. That is not true of everything. One of the areas I spend a lot of time in is autonomous vehicles. I was joking with someone yesterday. In 2018, I was in New York, and I gave a lecture on, the, on autonomous vehicles. And someone in the audience raises their hand and says, we're here in New York. When are they going to be here? And I boldly say, well, by 2024, probably 3 to 5% of all taxi rides will be in autonomous vehicles. Well, if you've been in New York recently, you know that is not the fact. I did offer to buy him a beer if I was wrong, so I do owe him some money. And I don't want this to dissuade you from listening to the rest, because, well, if I couldn't predict that, how can I predict AI? I think I do a little better on AI. We'll see. But the point is, there are things that have been expansive in their development, and there are things that have been highly compressed. What makes AI so special, especially Gen AI, is it has just taken off like a rocket. That S shape, you can barely even see the beginning of the S. It just has been so incredibly fast. So it's really important for us to understand where is this going to take us for society as a whole, and social policy in particular. <clears throat> so if I'm going to use my crystal ball, I need to have some grounding principles so that we can, and I can better share with you what it is that I'm going to be forecasting. So let me start with a few considerations. And I've got five of them that I want to share before I'm willing to actually open the crystal ball and look inside it. The first is I need you to learn from Yogi Berra. So Yogi Berra probably works better in New York than it does in Tel Aviv, but hopefully you'll get it. Yogi Berra was a very successful baseball player in the United States. And he was also known for his aphorisms. And as a result of that, he one of his famous ones is, it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. All right. So you prefer me to use this? Yeah. OK, got it. Hopefully this helps. All right, so let's be clear. Anytime you're making a projection, it is a little hard to do. But with that caveat, let me move on. So consideration number two is that 
When we talk about the impact of AI on society and on social policy, we need to recognize there are many different perspectives. We gotta get more of you engaged in this. It's a very effective way of showing the interrelationship in a complex system. This happens to be an economy, and you can see some aspects of it. You can see household income level. You can see government funds. You can see government spending ratio. You can see changes in gross output. All of these are interrelated. In many of these places, AI is playing an important role, whether that's forecasting, doing other forms of prediction. And so don't just look at AI as a simple aspect. Oh, the AI associated with doing a better job of thinking about how we're going to manage government funds doesn't sit by itself. It is impacted by other aspects, and it impacts other aspects. Yes, it's true that if you are writing a ChatGPT poem for your child's 15th birthday, don't recommend it. But if you did, that's fine. I don't care. But as soon as you're doing something that has broader impact on society, you need to understand the overall ecosystem we're working in. So I want you to have that in your mind as I give my projections as well. Number four is we need to learn from history. While we are sitting here and lots of people are talking about this is revolutionary, we've never seen anything like it before, the fact is we have seen disruptive innovation happen in the world every so often. This is not a brand new concept where we can have no basis for making projections on. So you can see up here, I've got my printing press, probably the single most dramatic change we've seen is the Industrial Revolution. Now I know some of you are looking at, no, 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 it's the digital and information transformation. That's the most important. No, I don't agree with you. I think the most fundamental transformation we've seen, disruption, is the Industrial Revolution. We've got the car. We've got not just big things, but we've got sectoral changes. So the idea of nuclear power, kind of completely revolutionary, very disruptive to a sector, not just not an industry, uh, not the economy as a whole, but to a sector. And then, of course, we do have the information age, the internet. And then we have my favorite. How many people, raise your hand, be honest about this, know what this bottom image is? Okay, not too bad. This is a slide rule, and my group down here knew it very well. Uh, he, he's very, very excited over here. So every innovation has differential impacts. Remember my slide that says we've got the individual, we've got the community, et cetera. So for me personally, this innovation associated with this was transformative because when I was in high school and I was trying to do higher level math, this is what you had to learn how to use. This stood between an abacus and a calculator. And it wasn't easy to use. And it wasn't all that accurate either. I mean, who's going to question that? You felt it was really pretty accurate, probably. You were probably better skilled at it than I was. OK. So fortunately, when I left high school and started college, the Bomar brain had come on the scene. It was a calculator. And that followed with TI coming out with its and HPs coming out with its. And this has been relegated. And that relegation is actually quite good because it wasn't just high school students who were miserable by it. Engineers, scientists, all have much more accurate mathematical information as a result of the calculator. Now, when it first, the calculator first came out, the cries from parents were outrageous. How can you use this? How will people not know how to use this technology? They'll not know how to add, subtract, multiply, divide, do logarithms, et cetera. And you know what? I think we're all better off with it. Parallels with how people are talking about large language models, whether it's ChatGPT or Claude or any of them. OK, so these are big changes. So what can we learn from the past? And I'm going to pick up on the the slide you showed with the green and red. It seems to be the thing to, the way to talk about this stuff. So here's what I walk away with from history. 
The first and most important is the acceleration of knowledge, productivity, and economic growth. If you think about the Industrial Revolution, you think about the impacts of the Digital Revolution, these have dramatically changed economic growth on a global basis, economic health on a global basis. So there is no question there can be very significant benefits. But I do have some reds. Societal anxiety and resistance to change. Big issue. Has been at every stage of the process. And it will be with AI as well. Workforce displacement and transformation. If we think about the Industrial Revolution, and you remember back to your history class, the shift from rural population farming into industrial city centers, the role of women, girls in that process was absolutely transformative. But it from a, had a, some negative impacts, had some positive impacts. Others, economic inequality. The Industrial Revolution, the, right now the technology, the digital revolution, is really creating a set of economic haves and have-nots. We've also, throughout these transformative changes, seen dramatic changes in concentration of players. Think about it in the railroad industry. It was a bunch, and then it was very few. In the petroleum industry, a lot, and then very few. You're seeing it right now in the digital space. What happens with AI probably will be quite similar. Ethics and regulation lag behind innovation. That is persistently the case. The innovate, who are our innovators in the room? So those, all of you with startups, come raise your hands. Come on, there's more of you than that. You're always a step ahead of the regulator because you, there is an information asymmetry. You know more about the technology than anyone who's going to try and regulate you knows about it. And as a result, there's a lag, a, an inability for policy to respond. I think one of the takeaways from today's session will be if you're in the social policy space, how do you better inform the policymaker so they can make faster decisions as well as better decisions? Faster matters when you're dealing with a brand new technology. There have also been some cultural shifts, social identity, especially as people move from rural, spa rural spaces to urban spaces. And there's one other that doesn't get much press, and I know it's not as relevant from a social policy perspective, and that's around security and warfare's evolution, because throughout history, we've seen a pretty dramatic change in that as well. All right, so I've got one more consideration before I actually give you some forecasts, and that is the heaven or hell scenario. Uh, there's a woman named Robin Chase. She is the founder of uh, car, a car, car share operation in the U.S. And when autonomous vehicles first became a thing, she went out with a lecture talking about the heaven and hell scenarios. And I like that. I think it's an interesting contrast. It takes us to the extremes as opposed to the middle. And even though we may end up in the middle, we should understand what the extremes are. So here's heaven, here's hell. Let me show you what might sit in the heaven. The heaven of AI is that we end up with global prosperity. Everyone wins out of this. We have longer, healthier lives because our healthcare panel you're gonna hear from a little later today is gonna to talk about all the amazing things that we can do with AI that will help people's lives. That actually, AI turns out to be a equalizer rather than a differentiator. In other words, people who don't have the same skills can use AI to enable them to be more effective. And we, as a result of AI, have a lot of facts and truth. Now, having given you that rather Pollyannish view, I'll also give you the hell scenario. Polarization and conflicts. There are haves and have-nots. There is famine and migration. Why would there be famine and migration? Well, the famine may well come more out of climate change, but the migration comes back to the chart that Avi put up. You looked at it from a particular sector, and I presume it was in Israel, 
that you are that you are looking. But if I look at that differentially in developed countries versus developing countries, some of those major changes, for example, the call center. If I have a really good chat bot, I do not need that person in Asia who currently has a pretty good job, that goes away. So you may see some real differentiation taking place. There's a real concern about there are fewer haves and many more have nots, especially on Avi's side of the chart over here, which was these are people who are likely to lose their position. And then fakes as truths. Uh, you may have seen some of the fakes that were done of Biden early on in the campaign uh, for presidency, where they basically created an AI version of Biden, looked like him, talked like him, slept like him. That was for the Americans in the group. Okay, so heaven and hell. So this is the foundations I want you to have. Hard to predict the future. You got to think about it from the individual, the community, the country, and the world. In thinking about this, we're going to learn from history, and we know what the extremes look like. So with that, let me give you a little more detail about heaven and hell. So on the heaven side, what might we look for? Well, I think one of the things we will likely see is healthcare transformation. Again, you're going to hear from some folks talking about that. But better medicine, more universally available, that has real positive impact. And AI has an, ama has an amazing ability to be able to deliver that. And I probably should pause here to give you my punchline at the end. Might as well give it to you now in case you fall asleep. And that is, success is AI plus a human. That's what success is. It is not just AI blind. AI, human, success. And I wanted to use that in this case because one of the things that we've observed is AI can be amazing at finding tumors but you also want a human in the loop as well. All right, so that's the first one. The second is employment and workforce changes. It is quite clear lots of jobs will disappear. Avi showed you. These are the ones on the chopping block. But he also showed you there were a bunch on the growth side as well. Anytime we've seen disruption, we've seen change. The reason it's so important to remember the individual, the community, the state, is these kinds of workforce dislocations are at the individual level. They are at me and you. And so the idea of thinking about it globally, that net-net, our total job change will be zero, is not helpful. From a social policy perspective, how do I protect that person who lost their job and do not have the skills to be able to instantaneously become one of the winners? Personalization of education. Uh, there's a lot of work going on right now on chatbots, which can be used for an individual to help them hone their, their skills. Uh, I hear about it uh, from students. I've seen some startups working on this. So it's a way to extend the reach of education without having to have more teachers. Now, more teachers is a good thing. I'm not dissing that group. But having some bonus time is a way to do it. Transportation and mobility, well, I'm an autonomous vehicles person, so I'm very interested in this. Uh, but the idea of being able to have better, faster, and more connected and greener transportation is really important. Uh, in Boston right now, uh, we're partnered with Google looking at all of our traffic signals to think about how we can time sequence them better to flow people better through the city. Uh, Nir drove me down from Jerusalem yesterday. Uh, Israel might want to take advantage of that concept. <laughs> Environmental protection, being more efficient, being greener. Cybersecurity, being able to have more safeguards but at the individual level, at a societal level. Now, this one will shock you. Social media and content generation actually does have the potential to be on the heaven side. You'll probably be more thinking about on the hell side. Uh, but more connectivity, better flow of information, 
kind of giving you what you want presented in a very compelling fashion. Those are some goods. Finance and banking, I mean, fintech is a big thing here in Israel. You hear about it lots of places. Can we get global? Can we get faster? Can we get cheaper? And then I wouldn't want to leave as someone who teaches in a school of public policy without talking about government and public services. One of the things I spend a lot of time on right now is how do I get government agencies to prioritize, identify and prioritize AI use cases? How can we bring AI into government so you as the constituent get a better service and you as a taxpayer get more value for your tax dollars? So these are on the heaven side. Let's switch to the hell side. So job displacement. So undoubtedly, there'll be excessive losses. And unfortunately, we have a long history, at least in my country, of not thinking about how those changes are going to happen and the dislocation, and how do we minimize the negative effects? I can take you to one example that was very potent in Trump's 2016 win, and that was coal mining. So the fight in 2016 was over 32,000 coal mine jobs that Trump vowed to protect. Now, independent of the election, he didn't really protect them. Those jobs are going away. And if you are a third generation coal miner living in Appalachia, there's nothing else. When that job goes away, you're not going to learn how to be a coder the next day. So thinking about an understanding, how do we plan for and prepare people for those jobs that are going away so they will have an alternative? A second is around human dependency and skill degradation. So notwithstanding my belief that calculators were the best thing ever, because I didn't want to really get good at a slide rule, the fact is we are becoming more and more dependent upon technology and AI. So someone, when I asked, how have you used technology so far, or AI so far today, someone over here said, Waze. I turned on Waze. So I have two daughters. Daughter one can drive anywhere in the world. You give her a map, and her innate sense of direction, she'll get there. I have a second daughter. Her first thing she bought when she had her own money was a Garmin. Anyone remember what a Garmin was? It was a GPS system because she couldn't get from our house to her friend's house two kilometers away without it. Right. That's dependence. But increasingly, we're st starting to see that. How many of you, when you type an email and it starts to fill in that, by the way, it's an AI system that is filling in the rest of the email for your sentence. Do you ever, and then you just press enter and it takes you to the end. But here's what I want you to, Here's what I want to know. When you do that, are the words that were chosen the exact words you would use? Half the time. Okay? So we are basically now habituating ourselves to the half the time that the algorithm said the next word was X. All right, so that's an example. That's a trivial example. But does it mean we lose our competitive advantage? Do we lose any intellectual horsepower? Privacy and surveillance AI has an ability to do that nonstop. Corporations and governments eroding our personal freedoms and our privacy. A real concern is bias. If the algorithm is trained on data of what has been, and that is mostly what it is, does it just perpetuate that? From an employment perspective, it is a major problem. Because if I am in investment banking and I use my history of the best performers in my organization to determine for me who the next person is I hire, and I throw it all into an LLM and I, out it pops, it is going to most likely pop out with white male rugby players. Why? Because the white male is perpetuating what it has seen, and it turns out that rugby players have the attributes of being very competitive, very hard driving, and if you're investment banking and you want people to work 23 hours a day for you, 
that may be the right thing. But what is it leaving out? It is excluding a huge portion of potential. That's the bias we worry about. Uh, certainly concentration of power, we're seeing that in the tech industry right now. In the US and in Europe, you're seeing actions to try and reduce that concentration in power. Alternative facts, uh, you don't need an AI system to create alternative facts, but it certainly amplifies those alternative facts. There is a huge environmental issue. Large language models are large what consumers. Yell it out in English. Energy. They suck up electricity like nothing else. And if that electricity is coming from fossil fuels, all we're doing is taking, remember my complex systems diagram? You're taking one piece of that on climate change and just making it worse. It also connects back to the concentration because you've got to have the ability for massive processing capacity in order to be successful. Amazon Web Services, wow, they control a huge portion of that market. Safety and security, weapons on steroids is certainly one. I don't need to talk about that here. And loss of autonomy. So these are heaven and hell. All right, so now let's actually get to some predictions. So here's my forecast. So I've got on one side, you've got the heaven scenario and the hell scenario. And the good news is you won't find anything in either extreme. Well, you might want to see them on the heaven side. Then nothing's going to be all the way over. So let's start with privacy. So, and by the way, I'm going to be around all day. You want to take pot shots at me. You want to say, I don't agree with you. Fine. I'd be happy to discuss these. These are one person's perspectives. And remember, Yogi Berra says it's really hard to predict the future because you don't know what's going to happen. All right. On privacy, I'm a little closer on the heaven scenario than the hell scenario. Why would that be? Because we have given away most of our information already. The fact that you have a cell phone and it is being tracked, the fact that you're buying history at every store, every time you get into a get taxi, everywhere, your information is already out there. And what's interesting from a generational perspective is while I and my wife think a lot about this, my daughters in their 30s, don't even think about it. What are, what are they going to get? What are they going to do? And if you think about social media, everything's out there. So that's why I'm not so worried on the privacy. In terms of quality of life, I'm on the good side of that as well. I think AI, especially in the healthcare space, has a real transformative potential. And it isn't just in the developed world. It certainly will be in the developed world. But being able to use telehealth, being able to use algorithms in less developed worlds where the healthcare system is not as robust, I think has a lot more potential than it has harm. On the economic prosperity, again, I'm on the side of the heaven, but I want to recognize that here it's going to split. I think there are geographies that are particularly dependent on humans that can be easily replaced. Call center in Asia, I think they're in real trouble because I can do a, probably a better job than a human with an AI in answering most of your questions, certainly taking your orders or your returns and things like that. So here, there'll be prosperity for a lot of people, but I think if I go back to my individual community country, I think there will be communities that will be particularly hard hit. Because if you go to India, there are places that are call center centric. It is where the vast majority of the economic activity in that community takes place. That could vaporize just like this. From a safety and security perspective, I'm right in the middle. I can see how this can help. I can see how this can hurt. I, I don't see this as being a big differentiator. In terms of employment, uh, here, and what I think a lot of people in the room are really worried about, is what happens here. So you can see I'm not all the way in the hell scenario because I looked at your chart. I didn't actually look at your chart, but I was delighted to see your chart before I got up here because now I had a fact base to work from. And so in his chart, if you looked at it carefully, you saw on the negative side, it was there were more dots on the negative than the positive. 
It was actually centered slightly to the side, but it was a balance. The point that you made that I thought was particularly relevant was it's differential. There are some sectors that will be very hard hit, and there will be some sectors that will not be as hard hit. But in addition to that, there's an issue of timing. How quickly does it happen? The pace actually makes a big difference. One of the reasons that the Industrial Revolution turned out to be so dramatically positive was it didn't happen overnight. It was a progression. And when you have a progression, you have time for people to adapt, to be educated, to transform. And so here, I think we've got a real challenge, but it may be manageable. In the absence of policy to change it, I think it will slide at least here or maybe even to the further to the right. But I am optimistic that policymakers will listen to the reports that you're putting out and your colleagues here and do some responsive. In terms of fairness and equity, I think this is a problem. I think the haves and have nots will grow as AI continues. It will allow people who are particularly agile at being able to use this to be much more productive. Uh, for those who can't or have a digital divide, I think it'll be a real problem. In Israel, you are constantly thinking about the center versus the periphery, and I think this is an issue that you'll need to grapple with with AI as well. And then finally, on the truth, I'm really pessimistic. Uh, I, I think the fake news and the ability to do very compelling fakes uh, will continue to grow as we think about uh, the future in AI. Now, I mentioned this idea of timing. The faster it comes, probably the more disruptive it is. The slower, the more time you have to work through and make sure it's going to be effective. So let me share with you. Oops. Mm, nope. Let me share with you some accelerators. So if you think about what will move this faster, I think we can think about them from a personal, operational, economic, and political perspective. So from a personal perspective, the accelerators are if people trust and believe in AI, it's going to happen a lot faster. If we have education, skill development, going to happen faster. Operational. If you have data, you can't do much in AI without training data. Yes, you can write your poem to your kid, but other than that, you can't do a lot of useful real work. Computational power. Turns out that NVIDIA and those chips are the limiter right now. If you want an NVIDIA chip, first of all, you're probably not going to be able to buy one because they're all bought up for years. Secondly, it's even hard to rent them. So that might limit it. Or, but if they were more available, it would accelerate it. Cross-industry collaboration. If you're doing something in the healthcare world and you're not also doing it in the social policy world, you might not get the full value out. Integration with existing systems, again, an accelerator. On the economic side, if you've got business and economic incentives that are encouraging AI, it's going to grow. If you've got successful case studies, nothing sells a product like a successful product. So if you can show that this works well in use cases, people will adopt them. And then politically, if you have AI-friendly regulations and politics, and you kind of got global collaboration, these will all take Everett Rogers' S-shaped curve and make it even more accelerated. On the decelerator side, if we don't trust, it's going to take longer. If there are data privacy issues, it's going to take longer. If we don't have a good workforce, if there are limited availability of chips, of electricity, if there's complexity and risk in what we're doing, it's all going to slow us down. Economics, high cost to implement. By the way, AI systems sound great, deliver a lot of value. They are expensive, time consuming, and they require a lot of cultural change in an organization. You've got to get people willing to use them. In my work in government, oh my gosh, it is like pulling teeth. And because government officials are risk averse, and I don't blame them, because I don't want to see my name on a screw up on the New York Times front page. 
In terms of political issues, if there's regulatory or legal challenges, that could slow us down. If we're worried about bias, that could slow us down, et cetera. So these are the accelerators. These are the decelerators. What kind of guardrails do we have? If we're going to do something new, it's nice to have guardrails. There are two types of guardrails. One is governmental. So we've got the EU AI Act, risk-based pyramid, things at the top you are not able to do, things in the middle, eh, you got to have a little bit of regulation and a bunch of stuff at the bottom. I don't care. It's got minimal risk. Go do what you want to do. The flip side is on the US. This is from Biden. It's an executive order and it focuses on it should be performance driven, costs and benefits should be better, et cetera. I'm biased, experts. But here's the problem. As of January 20th, that's going away. There's no, no ambiguity about that. The industry itself also has a set of guardrails because they want to protect the industry. They want to make sure they aren't regulated. Or maybe if they've got a comparative advantage, they want to be regulated. So this is the world we live in. So let me wrap up with coming back and saying, well, what are the response strategies? If in fact those forecasts are right, what do you do? Number one on privacy, for you as an individual, know what you are giving away when you click the box. If you click the box on Ancestry.com, that DNA, your DNA is not yours anymore. It's theirs. From a governmental perspective, protect the vulnerable. I think one of the things that Taub really centers on, who are the vulnerable, how do we protect them? Here is important. Quality of life, leverage AI for health offerings, and for my own sake, please go take a ride in a, in a level four autonomous vehicle. It's a hoot. You'll love it. Uh, number three, economic prosperity. You got to share the wealth. AI will generate unprecedented amounts of wealth. If it is concentrated in four firms, we have a big problem on our hands. Safety and security, AI is a deterrent. And from a governmental perspective, you have to stay one step ahead of the bad guys. Not easy to do because of the information asymmetry we talked about, but it's real. Employment, plan ahead, be agile as you an individual. If you've got kids, think about those kids. What are they going to do? Take a look at Avi's chart and make sure you've thought about what sectors they're in. From a governmental perspective, plan ahead, fund and execute to understand the transformation. So when that coal miner loses their job or that person who is um, in a customer service job loses that job, they aren't left with nothing. From a fairness and equity perspective, we need some AI guardrails. You've got to have, from a governmental perspective, from an advocate's perspective, force government action a lot of what you do, and then from an organizational perspective, responsibility and accountability. And on the truth front, my last chart on, I got nothing. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you again. And thank you, first of all, for coming to Israel. I'm Gila Kurtz. I'm the Dean of Instructional Technologies Faculty at Holon Institute of Technology. Um, a quick question. Um, when you talked about heaven, uh, on he about uh, heaven with education, you talked about personalization. When we you got to the hell, nothing about education. So, are we going to heaven with education? <laughs> so, oh, just stand the mic. So, the the materials I put up are just snippets, and I'll go back to the chart that shows the ecosystem. I put one up about the economy. It's true about everything we do. Everything is an ecosystem. And so the education issue, the health issue, they merge. In fact, I think this afternoon or later today, you may hear a little bit of that because one of your speakers and I were chatting yesterday and she was telling me the transformation that has taken place in the way medical school education takes place from when she was a medical student to what people do today is, is dramatically changed. Part of that is the education, part of it's the knowledge of and, and change in, in uh, understanding of health and medicine. It's an ecosystem. They all have to fit together. And I think just one last thought on that. This idea of AI as a use case, and I pitch that a lot, and I'm guilty of this. 
I think right now it works because we're just trying to get our feet wet. We're trying to prove that this technology has value. But as we get better at it, we've got to integrate it. It's got to be part of the system. So here, so the question was, what happens to the environment as a result of, of AI? And here, like everything else, there's heaven and hell, and they're both happening simultaneously. The health side of this is the amount of electricity that's being sucked up by every time you go and do something on ChatGPT, you are generating carbon. Hate to tell you that, it's a reality. So there's a real negative there. And if we don't get more efficient with how the processors are working, we are gonna have a real problem because everyone wants to use the technology and it's consuming more power. So you gotta get more efficient at it. On, so that's the hell side. But let me give you the heaven side. The heaven side is, I was talking to some students and they're mid-career students and they're from Africa. And they were looking at the use of AI to better use water in their agriculture. Because traditionally what they've done is they've done flood irrigation. And it's very inefficient, it's very energy consuming because you gotta pump all the water out. And so what they're, they're looking at are AI algorithms that determine from the soil moisture itself and where we are in the crop growing cycle, exactly how much water to put on. So from that perspective, this is great. If we're successful, for example, in Boston at reducing congestion, that's a big win in terms of reducing carbon. Now, it would certainly be better if we all rode our bicycles and public transit were better, but the reality is that's not the case. AI can make a difference. So I think I can't give you a, it's gonna really help or really hurt. I can give you snippets right now of where it will help and where it will hurt. The point was, where does collaboration fit in this? Because it isn't an independent issue, it's a global issue, and I think you're exactly right. I'm quite skeptical on that. I've looked at the regulations associated with AI in multiple geographies. So in Europe, you know what they've done, the EU Act, and that's where a group of people came together and made a decision, fantastic. But if you look at the US, we're gonna have none. If you look at Singapore, you see very little. And it's driven by the function of what their economic systems require. If you're Singapore, you are looking for AI to be your next equivalent of finance. Finance was how you did, tr shipping is how you started, then you went to finance, what's next? If you can be the AI center and hub, that's important. You minimize regulation to do that. The, e the UK doing something very similar. Um, I think we're going to continue to see that polarization, which will make it more challenging. All right, I got to stand down. Thank you very, My very pleasure. much. Thank you.